We're back with a new episode in Dubai Stars. Today we have one of our own, uh, Romal Patel, uh, whom is the director of the property management in our office, Provident Estate, and she's managing over 250 properties, uh, which she's doing an amazing job, and you can verify that from the Google reviews about her and her department. But today we're not going to discuss business. We are here to know who Romal is, what she has done, all of the struggles she has passed through her life and what made her the person she is today. And for sure, she has some future plans that she would love to reveal on this podcast. So first of all, hello, Romal, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for having me on the show. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. So, yeah. Thanks. So basically, uh, like every guest, I asked them the first question was like, what brought you to Dubai? Why Dubai and what brought you to Dubai? To be honest, I, what brought me to Dubai was a change. I, I wanted to see a change. I uh, initially came out here on vacation to, to visit a couple of girlfriends and I went to school with. Mm -hmm. um, we studied with each other since we were five and we you know, grew up together. Uh, and two of them moved to Dubai to be EAs for large organizations. So this was a holiday hub for me for three years. Came out here the second first time, loved it. Uh, drew me back the second time. The third time I decided to book a ticket for a month and, and look for work in the industry that I was working for back in the UK, which is the health and fitness gym industry. Um, so I've always come from a service industry background, I would say, but uh, thrived so much in hospitality and uh, uh, working for health and fitness clubs because it was a role which allowed me to move around in the day, not, not be stuck at a desk and have a nine to five. So booked a ticket, got out here, um, started to look for work, contacted all your, your high end gyms here, fitness first, so on and so forth and um, uh, just started pitching myself. Um, how were you feeling? Were you scared? Were you excited? Uh, were you having the mis a mixed emotions like everyone yeah, used to have? Yeah, there was a lot of miscommunication. There was a lot of um, you know friends of mine saying, "Don't do it. It's not worth it. You know, this industry isn't going to take you far, and um, the pay isn't great, so on and so forth." But I just needed that foot in the door to be able to get in, get recognised, and really learn and understand Dubai, and you know, then push myself out to other industries. Explain um, to me the first time you came to Dubai. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us, we were fascinated by something. So what was it for you? It was the bright lights, city lights. It was the tall buildings. It was the quality of life. And sunshine for me is massive. Uh, what gets me out of bed is sunshine. Um, in Especially the UK, you're coming from the UK. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so in the UK, it's always dull and cold and, and every day is a, a moody day in effect. And I think it has a massive impact on someone's personality, um, you know, and, and how they, yeah, carry themselves throughout the rest of the day. If, if the day is miserable, you kind of slightly feel a little bit miserable inside, don't you? Um, no matter how positive you are, but uh, it was definitely the bright lights. It was a quality of life. I love food. So it was, um, you know, all the, the restaurants and, uh, um, and the clubs and the bars and, and, and everything and really. It was, you know what also attracted me is the fact that um, I am OCD and I like everything to be in place and everything has to be clean for me, you know. If I don't feel that, I get a little bit oh, on edge and it just keeps going round and round in my mind. But um, it was the fact that every street that I walked down, I could see my face in it, you know. And there was always someone walking probably behind me or behind someone mopping and cleaning. So again, that was a big thing for me. Um, uh, in the UK, uh, you know, you walk down the roads and you must know, it just feels like um, you're walking in the Bronx, you know, in some places. Um, I, I didn't feel safe there uh, as the years, you know, went on. But uh, yeah, it's just the safety aspect of it as well, to be honest. So, and how old were you when you moved here? I was 30. I'm 41 now. So God I, bless. Was, I was 30. Man, usually yeah. people when they're 30, they say, oh, it's too late now for a new change. We should adapt to the situation we are in, make the best of it. So and it's funny you say that because, you know, when I was here uh, looking for work in that one month, I had one day left until I flew back to the UK. Um, and I'll, I'll fast forward to that in a moment. But uh, before I took the opportunity to, to move out here, I actually sat back at my desk and thought to myself, am, is this going to be me now? I'm 30 years old. Am I going to be stuck here 
for a number of years and I'm not going to improve. So let's rewind now and go back to that one day I had left uh, to, to leave Dubai. I went to Amani. Mm -hmm. um, we were at social gathering with the friends of friends and uh, I clearly wasn't drinking that night because I had a flight um, the day after. So <laughs> it's funny because I met a gentleman at the table and uh, he wasn't also drinking. He and I just started having a great conversation about just generally Dubai and uh, you know the potential of the earning and his experience and when he came down here with literally nothing in his pocket and where he was at that point in his life. Um, and he asked me to come in and sit with him and um, meet him. But I took it with a pinch of salt. I didn't think there was nothing to it until the following day. Um, in the morning, I got a phone call from a friend of a friend that invited me to the table um, to say, Raj wants to meet with you. He, he wants to, to see you. And I was like, well, look, I'm leaving um, midnight tonight. And it was like, look, he definitely wants to see you. I, you know, just come and meet with him. I met with him. And uh, it was a real estate agency called Blue Sky Properties. They were based in Al Basha. Mm -hmm. um, I went over and he um, said, look, there's something about you. You had a spark last night. I can really see you doing well out here. I'd like you to come and work for me. So you naturally asked, what's my salary? You know, what am I going to get paid? Of course. And there's, oh, sorry, there's no salary. I'm like, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not but there's a visa, which is like, wow. <laughs> Um, so he explained the commission structure and, and how it worked um, and then for him to convince me um, and make an informed decision he started showing me salary certificates of individuals that were working for him. And it was unbelievable, the numbers that I was looking at and I was converting them into pounds, I was like no way, how can someone make 100,000, 200,000 a month in, in sterling, not dirhams, in sterling. So this is too good to be true. No, I took it with a pinch of salt. Like, Thank you for your time. We'll be in touch. I'll, I'll keep you posted. Uh, we swapped our details naturally. He added me though to a company group, a WhatsApp group that they had. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, every day I was getting these news updates on what's happening in the market in, in property. I kept disregarding them, kept disregarding them, kept disregarding them. At least once every fortnight he'll call me. A quick tease, have you handed your notice in yet? When are you coming? Have you handed your notice in? When are you coming? I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not leaving behind this life where I'm secure. I've got my family here. I've got a great dog. I've got a salary coming in on a monthly basis. It wasn't enough, but it was paying my way and my luxuries in life. So I come from a background where, you know, I've never really had to work. Uh, my family have always provided for me. I've been one of the, the luckiest, I would say, you know, daddy's girl. Um, so if I wanted a car, I'd get a car. If I wanted a pair of shoes, I'd get a pair of shoes with just giving Dad the puppy eyes. Um, but I, I didn't want to leave that comfort in effect, you know, to come here in a city where I knew, you know, it's going to cost to to live. It's going to cost to, you know, to get on with life in effect. Um, so. It was one day, maybe six months after I had met Raj, I had gone outside to um, have a smoke and it was pouring with rain outside. Um, I smoked, I came inside, I got a, a WhatsApp message from Raj to say, have you handed your notice in? Question mark, question mark, question mark. I sat at my desk, I looked at the wall, turned around, faced the admin lady who was behind me and I said to her, Kim, how long have you been working here? She's like, oh, I've been here 35 years. Wow. I was like, wow. Okay, doing the same thing. She was like, yeah. I turned around, looked at the wall and I said, I can't do that. I cannot do it. So I went home, I spoke to my dad, I said to him, listen, I've been given an opportunity to go to Dubai to work in an industry they are um, offering me no basic, but a commission structure. Naturally, my dad being dad would be uh, said to me, well, why would you want to do that? You know, uh, how are you going to earn? What if you don't earn? So I said to him, I would obviously have to take my savings out there with me. So he goes, look, okay, I will always support you. Whatever you want to do, go for it. If it doesn't work out, you can always come back home. So I said to him, okay, fine, fair enough. So I called Raj, I went upstairs to my bedroom, called Raj and I said, Raj, okay, I'm seriously thinking about moving out there now. 
what are you, what can you offer me? He was like, the only thing that I can offer you is no salary and and this package. He said to me, come out here with five thousand pounds. If it doesn't work, I'll give you five thousand pounds back. All you've got to do is make sure you've got a return ticket to go home within three months. So I said, right, okay. So a bit of safety. Yeah. yeah. So he goes, I'll give you that five thousand dirhams back. And I said to him, okay, let me switch it here. I'll tell you what, you give me five thousand dirhams. If it doesn't work, I'll give that back to you. And I go home in three months time. I'll book my own ticket. So he was like, oh, look, let me think about this. I'm not sure, blah, blah, blah. So I then said to him, well, clearly you're not being honest with me. There's something that I should be knowing that you've not brought to my attention. Mm-hmm. He was like, no, no, no. So then I questioned him about accommodation. I said to him, well, where would I stay? What would I do? How would I do this? And he goes, look, I've got a friend. He's a, a radio presenter here in Dubai. He's leaving to go back to the UK. Um, I can take his unit over. There's six months left on it, but you would have to pay the rent and the bills. And I said, okay, fine, that's no problem. How much are they? So I started doing my numbers. Um, the final deal was, okay, I said to him, I would only come down if you give me the 5,000 dirhams for me to pay my way for the next three to six months. Three months, in effect. He agreed. All of my girlfriends are like, don't do it wrong, you know, it's, it's a scam, it's not going to work, you know, don't know who this guy is and he's giving you all of this, it's unheard of, you know, either he wants something out of it or there's, you know, something's not sitting right. And I spoke to a friend of mine, Georgie, and I said, Georgie, what shall I do? Because she always gives me raw the best advice, advice is, the yeah. raw advice, you know, and I, for some reason I, I, I could feel her honesty. Ramel, give it a go, pack your bags, come. Okay, Ran Raj, I was like, I'm doing it, I'm coming. I want to see the place. He sent me videos of the place, picked me up from the airport, took me over to the place, settled me in, and said, Right, okay, the shops are over there. If you need anything, let me know. Uh, for the first uh, month, I'll get the driver to pick you up and take you home. If there's anything else that you need, you'll have the driver, but you need to start preparing yourself to get your driving um, and get a car in place. Obviously, it was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I arrived on, on a Thursday. I had Friday and Saturday to settle in, in effect, with suit, four suitcases. One suitcase was handbag and shoes. One suitcase was like work clothes. The second suitcase was like just chill clothes and, and, and evening wear. And the third one was pictures and teddies and photos and books and things. So you knew you were moving. You yeah. were confident that you yeah. were moving. It's but not I like did. you're coming to try and come back. Yeah, you but I didn't it. want to bring my whole life over because I've done that before. Prior to me moving to Dubai, I was living in Spain and mm-hmm. I'd taken my whole life over. And then I had to ship it back over again and I had to wait months for the, the shipment to come back at that particular time. So I didn't want to make that mistake again. Um, so the four suitcases are settled in. Sunday morning, driver was outside, picked me up, took me into work. The first year was the worst year of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about month by month. The first month um, went by easily. The second month went by. The third month went oh, by. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up right here. This is the most important part that yeah. you're fast forwarding. I want to know every night when you were coming back from work. I cried. The other voice in your head, yeah. you like leave, you're better than yeah. that. All of this, I want to know about it. How are you feeling? How did you overcome it? Why you good kept question. pushing? Yeah, yeah. Um, good question. I hate failure and I will never give up and, and, until I've given it all my best. Um, so every night I came home and I analyzed the day because I, I analyze. I, you know, you have that, 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 that conversation in your mind. You have the, the devil and the, the angel both at you at the same time. And, I was in my apartment thinking that this is this is not what I was expecting. You know, um, it was hot. I came in July. Um, I I couldn't you know handle the heat. Um, uh, my anxiety went through the roof. You know, um, I had dad on the other end going, "Fuck it, come home. You don't need to do this. You've I'm got here everything you. here." And yeah. I was like, "No, I'm going. I'm going." And I was literally hand to mouth, hand to mouth after three months had gone by and. And I wasn't closing the deal. I just, whatever I did, it didn't work. Because I came from a service industry back at home in the UK, my service levels were up here. Yes, sir, no, sir, I'll be there in five minutes. I never really did, uh, um, I never really, um, uh, what's the word? I never um, 
questioned my prospect clients. You know, when do you want to move in? How many checks? What's your budget? Blah, blah, blah. I just ran to do the viewing because I was desperate to earn money. And that desperation was oozing out of me. Of course. You know? It grows. Um, yeah. And um, the nights were rough. Uh, I remember I used to cry. I, I used to try and sleep. I, I was actually, I started sleepwalking because I was so stressed. Um, you know, especially with, I had to do my rear exam as well. I'll give you an example of what happened one day as I was sitting at the desk in this apartment and uh, had my laptop up and I had speakers connected to the laptop. And I was um, trying, I was going online on YouTube and, and everywhere and anywhere just to find information about rear and the questions that they had asked, what the course would entail because I felt like I was in the dark so much. Um, and uh, I'd gone to bed and I remember shutting the laptop I'd gone to bed and I'd woken up and it was blaring out of the speakers in the living room and I was like, oh my God, what's going on, you know? I'd gone in and my laptop was back up again and it was coming out of the speakers. So I was like, oh, that's, that's weird, you know? So I turned it all off again and went back to bed. Um, and maybe a couple of days later, I had another episode, uh, when, two episodes, in fact, that identified that I was sleepwalking, right? <laughs> um, so one of them was the fact that I turned all the lights off and I'd gone to bed, again, very OCD, made sure things shut, all the, the doors and the windows and gas and everything. I'd gone back to bed and um, woke up and the lights were on. <laughs> so I was like, what's going on? This place is <laughs> this is out. <laughs> <laughs> so I rang the, the owner of the company who had recruited me and I said, there's something going on in my house. There's something, um, it's haunted. And then he started teasing me saying, yeah, did you not know that Discovery Gardens was built on a graveyard? Mm. I was like, get me out of here. I don't want to do this anymore. I just can't handle it. And it, I started pouring out my actual true feelings of how I felt being out then and the frustrations that I had and, and not earning anything. Uh, third episode was uh, I had this great big beehive outside my balcony window. And I remembered, I always just say to myself, never open that door because there was this great big beehive. One day in the morning, I woke up, came home, and the doors were wide open. <laughs> and so on. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, wow. Anyway, so that was that. So that just gives you a true um, understanding of how your mind really uh, plays so tricks. So let's summarize it. It was very rough for you. You couldn't uh, at least get to know the mindset of the clients coming your way, how to deal with them. It was mm -hmm. totally different way from the UK. Yeah. Uh, you were lonely. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have money, mm. so I'm sure, and you were feeling like, let's not say a loser, but anyway, I did actually. Yeah, I, I kept I, saying I don't want to use the word, but, but for sure yeah. you will have the feeling. So all of these feelings which were bringing you down, making you a depressed person, and you have the super easy route going back home by your father telling you, come home, forget about all mm. of that. What kept you? There is something that kept you in here. Like everything is negative, yeah. is dark, and you have a way out, which most of the people would have taken it. Something kept you in here. I was confident. I was confident that I could make it work. And I didn't want to go back to the UK. And I didn't want to set back into that I that life that I was in, you know. What kept me was the fact that I hate failure. I don't think you're uh, you're answering it like that's the pure honesty. I think you never went back to the UK because you were ashamed of your parents or your friends. You know, because everyone told you're right. you don't go. You are right. And you went. Yes. And you were like, I cannot come yeah. back empty-handed. I'm like like yeah. the, the lost soldier. Spot on. Yeah. Spot on. You you are right actually. You that are, was it. You yeah. are right. I mean, if I look back at it now, yes, that is a hundred percent spot on because. Agreed. A lot of them were saying it's not going to work. It's not going to work, and I, I didn't want to. I didn't want them to say I told you so. Mm. And yeah, that's what I would have thought. It was a super uh, yeah. motivation, yeah. you know, like yeah. happy days they did. Yeah. All right, got me from the first year past. It was rough. I was hand sure. to mouth. It was horrible. I introduced a VIP service to my clients. People laughed at me in the office. Like, what are you? Are you an agent or are you a PA? So. I offered a service which allowed my owners to sit back, relax, and allow one agent to handle that property. And I explained the importance of them having one agent to, to manage and look after their properties, sell it, rent it, whatever. And when I used to have a prospect call me for the property, I used to say to them, again, I would like to work with you exclusively on this, because on your search, because there are many agents out there um, that can show you these units, nine times out of 10, they're gonna say the door's open, please go and have a look. Let me earn my commission. 
let me make this process easy for you. Let me make it enjoyable for you. You know, when people are buying a home, they, they want a good experience, right? That we, don't, we don't want to put them off of, of buying that property. Um, when they're renting a home, they, they want a good experience. And again, that service kind of um, background that I had always kept coming back in. So I used to take exclusivity from the prospect to say, if you don't like the way I'm dealing with you within 48 hours, feel free to cancel the exclusivity and move on to another agent. All prospects, they all love going on to Bizzle on Property Finder and on Bayut to search for units. So I said to them, please continue doing that, but just send me all the links on one email. Explain it to me once, sit down with me, have a coffee, let me understand what you're looking for, high floor, low floor, 01 unit, 02 unit, which area, let's identify that. Then I know, I, I know what you're looking for, I can go out and search for it. Right, so continue doing what you're doing, but send me the links and I'll speak to all the agents to find out whether this meets your requirements. So I started to get prospect tenants to do so. So that in effect, they were doing my job for me because they were identifying what they wanted, sending me the link. I would then make the phone calls to the agents or to the owners if I had direct listings. And then I would set two hours with the prospect arrange viewings with the agents if it was an agent to agent or with the owner with regards to getting the keys and allocation of the keys and having the doors left open for us to go in and visit. I would take the client in my car so I would control listening to the conversations that he and she, the husband and wife might have been having together, boyfriend and girlfriend, family could be having together and what the pros and cons were on that particular unit. I would allow them to go in and, and, and see each unit, walk around them behind, taking notes of what they are saying. At the end of doing five or six viewings with them in that space of two hours, I would go home, I would send them everything that they had seen alongside the notes that I had taken with them. i would say to them, right, now have a look at this that I've sent you. Identify the units that you want to go back for a second viewing for. The ones that you won't will eliminate that. So surprisingly, they came back and said, right, okay, out of the five that we've seen, I want to go back and have a look at three. So then I'd arrange that and go through that process again and say, right, okay, out of the three now, identify and eliminate the others. If you want to go back for another viewing, do let me know. Nine times out of 10, out of the three, they would say, we want to finalize on this one. So I started to see that the system was working. I was like, right, okay. So I started promoting that system with the people that I was working with. Until one day, and these were small, small, small rentals. Um, until one day I had a client that was selling or wanted to sell one of his penthouses on the Palm Jumeirah and that was one of my biggest deals and that was remember a year and a half after I moved out here so I was in a lot of debt with the owner of the company because he saved me in a way and he, he was investing in you yeah and he also said look you will make it don't worry I've got you I've got you I've got you and I, I just kept I felt ashamed because I felt like I was relying on someone that had no relation to me whatsoever and if he believes in me and doesn't want me to go back, there's got to be something there with me because I was a legend in the UK when it came to sales. I was hitting a company target single-handedly, you know, and being recognised for that and then coming out here and being that loser really affected my mindset, you know, and like maybe I am rubbish, maybe I am shit at what I'm doing, so, hence why I came up with this new system. So it started to work. So the first deal that I did is I had um, a, a penthouse that was available for sale in the Golden Mile. And uh, the owner, um, he spoke my mother tongue, Kudrathi, and this is what made me you know, take the exclusivity on it and convince him I was the right agent to have the exclusivity on the property. A week later, I get a phone call from a, an agent called Anna. I remember her name quite clearly as well, because how can you forget your first deal? Um, she called me and she said, I've got a client who wants to view your penthouse. And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. You know, it's for sale. Um, this is how much it is. Is he cash or finance? I started to understand the right questions to ask. Um, we did the viewing. The, um, I, and I didn't want to step on her toes when it came to the viewing. So I said to her, look, I'll, I'll wait by the door. You're, you're with your client. Walk them around. If you need any help, I'm by the door. Um, She'd walk the client around. He then came downstairs into the lobby um, area and said, right, okay, so how much is the price per square foot? What are the service charges? What are the service charges broken down per square foot? Um, what other fees do I have to take into consideration? How much is the selling price? She kind of 
shrugged her shoulder at every single question. And I felt that I needed to intervene. So I said to her, do you mind if I answer these questions? And she was like, no, 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 please, if you don't mind. So I started, boom, 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 boom. These are the answers. Um, all of them, we, we all kind of discarded and moved on and uh, said thank you very much. They went their way, we went my way. Uh, the next day I get a phone call to say that the client wants to meet you again. I was like, oh sure, no problem, we'll go to the uh, penthouse and we'll meet at the penthouse again, the second viewing, right? She goes, no, he wants to meet you. And I was like, right, okay, is there anything that I can help with? Or are there any questions that you can get off of him before and then I can answer them for you? She was like, no, he wants to meet you. So we'd, we'd um, met with the, the prospect in Costa Coffee um, on the Palm Jumeirah on the right hand side, um, sat with him and he started asking more questions about the, 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 the property, who the owner was and um, is it owner occupied, is, um, you know, is it tenanted and does he have any prospects looking to tenant it, what can it rent for, um, you know, what changes he could make to the property, were there NOCs that were required. Um, he was an investor who picked up units, um, made some minor changes to them and flipped them, I, I came to know. Uh, after that meeting had finished, literally, I would say three hours later, Anna calls me and she says to me, um, uh, we'd like to go ahead with the deal. And it was like, wow. And it was all these emotions bursting inside me. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to sell something. Wow, I've done it. I've finally really, done it. Yeah. yeah. It was like I was standing on the edge of a, of a cliff, you know, when you look down and you get those, your knees are wobbling and your hands are shaking and your heart is beating. Um, Whenever running to Raj and I said, I think I've done my first deal. And it was like, right, okay, let me help you. And he told me what to do and what was next and so on and so forth. But anyway, long story short, moving forward, um, we'd done the MOUs, sent them over to the buyer and the seller to both understand the terms and the conditions of the memorandum of understanding. And back in those days, the MOUs were books. They weren't the pages that we do now via you know, the internet. Um, and for transparency, I was always taught from the agency that I worked for to have both parties together, you know, when it comes to signing and if there's any questions, you can kind of iron them out there. So I would arranged a meeting for the buyer and the seller to come and the agent obviously to come with uh, her, the buyer. And uh, my seller was sitting next to me and then the, the, the buyer came sitting next to Anna. So I said to the buyer, I hope you don't mind, I'm just going to go through this uh, memorandum of understanding in my language. To my, to my seller just so he understands it clearly. So I was going through all the points and as I was going through all the points and uh, the clauses, I, I asked him to initial each page. So I, the, um, the seller said to me, why are all these charges, when we got to the charges page, why are all these charges on me, NOC and so on and so forth? And I was like, because these are your liabilities that you have to do and pay before we you know, transfer the unit into his name. Did you see that he turned up in a Bentley, in my language, in my mother tongue? Do you see that he's turned up in a Bentley with a driver? Look at his watch, look at the way he's dressed. This man's got money. Put all of these charges onto him. And I thought, right, this deal's down the drain. So, you know, you kind of like, great. I sat there in my mother tongue and I said to him, no, I can't do that. I'm sorry, these are your charges. You were given a draft, you understand it. Just because this guy's now turned up, however he looks and in the car he's coming, you can't shift these payments. I find it highly disrespectful and embarrassing now to have to tell this guy that this is what you want when these are your fees. Please don't put me in this situation because I will say that the deal is off and I will explain to him why the deal is off. So it was like, okay, next time you sell another property of mine, make sure you, I, you, know, you tell me the, who your clientele is and whether he's got money or not and whether he can pay these. And I said, if there is a next time, because I'm really embarrassed right now. Again, all in my mother tongue. So I've turned around, I said, right, sorry, Anna and um, uh, uh, Varish. Um, I'll just go through the MOU with you now. And he goes, no, it's okay, where do I sign? So I said to him, no, I'm, I'm sorry, but I would really like to go through these with you because, you know, you're going to be issuing us a 10% security deposit check and it could be forfeited if you don't understand the clauses of this contract. Slammed his hand on the table. I was like, where do I sign? I was like, wow, okay. He could sense that there was something probably going on. So I, I said to Anna, you know, do you want a moment with your, with your buyer? And she was like, Varesh, please, you know, would you like to read it? He goes, I'm not going to say it again. Where do I sign? 
I started initialing every page. Then, um, once I'd issued everyone their copies and the receipts, um, and was ushering my sellers to the lift and taking them out of the door, Anna and Vera obviously stayed in the meeting room. Um, and I said to them, guys, please don't do this to me again. That was highly embarrassing and, you know, it's not fair. You can't do things like this. It's not ethical. I can't work like that. I don't work like that. Um, you know, uh, let's hope that the transfer goes smoothly and that there are no problems, you know, and you're not going to give me any more surprises. Can I, can you assure me that you're not going to throw any other surprises on, uh, you know, towards me? And he was like, yeah, 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 that's fine. But next time, let me know, blah, 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 on, on the prospect. I'd gone back in as I was going back into the meeting room. Anna's walking out of the meeting room, going to the lift. And she was like, okay, bye, I'll see you soon. So I was like, okay, bye. Uh, as I walked into the meeting room, Varesh is on the phone. So I said, sorry, excuse me one moment. I'm just going to grab my things. So I've just ushed, like, verbaled him. Um, I'm just going to grab my things. And I started to slowly pick things up. And he was on the phone and he was like, wait. So I stood there with my folders in my hand. He'd finished his call. And he goes, um, how long have you been in Dubai? And I said to him, only a year. And he goes, how long have you been doing real estate? And I went, only a year. I was honest, I didn't want to lie to him. Um, I go to him, is everything okay? And he goes, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I go, look, while you're here with me alone, if you don't mind, can I please go through the MOU with you, just so you understand? Because I don't want any problems moving forward. I just wanted to make sure all the T's were crossed and the, the I's were dotted, you know? Um, and I can always say to the seller, I made a mistake, um, uh, and I can ask him to re-sign. You know what he did? In the same mother tongue, he went, I understood everything you said. I was like, whoa, you speak Gujarati? Um, and he was like, yeah, I do. I understand everything that you said there. He goes, how do I get you as my agent? I go to him, but you have an agent. And he goes, only for this deal, I have an agent. But how do I get you as my agent? And I said, well, you're welcome to always give me a call. And I gave him my card. The transfer of that deal went through successfully. There was no problems with it whatsoever. After that, I got an invite to his home in Emirates Hills to go and sit with him and his family. He was my golden egg. He changed my life fully. After that penthouse transferred, it was transfer after transfer after transfer after transfer. Trusting after you transfer. blindly because Trusting at me. least you de defended his rights without even him asking for it. And he's seen that you're a decent person following the law and caring about uh, your client's uh, requirement, which is, which is amazing to have an exclusive buyer. Mm. I think few people in the city have done it. Yeah. And uh, this says a lot about the person. Like even when you go to the buy land department, they will tell you you can have an exclusive seller, but if you reach a point where you have an exclusive buyer, that you have made it big. Yeah. So yeah. So he um, introduced me then to a network of all of his friends, and then from that, again, they all just started calling me and, and buying and buying and buying, and that completely changed the game for me. But I didn't want it just to stop there. I didn't want it to just be me being an agent, which was, you know, uh, doing buying and selling or renting those units. I wanted to be more. So when it came to me um, renting the units for them, I provided that aftercare to the tenants, helping them with their diwa, their, um, their do, um, generally checking up on them to see if they were okay. Because Viresh used to prompt me, are the tenants okay? Uh, let me check for you. It wasn't in my scope, I wasn't mm -hmm. getting paid for it, but I wanted to keep my client happy. Um, and how he introduced me to a network of all of his friends is he invited me to his annual Christmas party at his villa in Emirates Hills. And it was quite strange because he called me about five times prior to me driving over. Um, and every time he called, he always said, did you bring your business cards? Do you have your business cards? And I couldn't, I was like, yeah, okay, I, yeah, I've got the business cards, but you keep asking me five times, like, business cards, business cards, business cards. I'd got there, after I'd settled in after 15 minutes, he literally walked me to each and every guest that he knew was going to be an uh, investor or would want to buy, buy and said, she's like my daughter, 
and she's my agent. If you need anything, call her directly. Give them your business card. <laughs> so I'd be like, there you go, lovely to meet you. Off I went. The mistake I did make though was I should have taken their numbers while I was there. You know, but um, I would say 80% uh, of them called me and, and I sold to, and I still made that. You do the network and yeah. the beautiful chain. Just yeah. want to ask you a question before we skip to the next one. You got your first commission check, the sales check. Yeah. The what did, did I do with it? Who did you call first? Who did I? You know, can I uh, be honest with you? Um, because it took a while for the transfer to happen, and when the the transfer was done and I got the check in my hand, the buzz had kind of gone in a way because I knew that I wasn't going to keep this money. It's going to go back to Raj because he was funding me while I was here. Um, but the answer to the question was I called dad and uh, I said to him, I made my first commission check. <laughs> um, and it's 50,000 dirhams. That's nearly, you know, back then the exchange rates were different. It's nearly, you know, 10,000 pounds, dad. And he was like, that's great. What are you going to do with it? And I'm like, I've got to pay Raj. <laughs> <laughs> it's done already. <laughs> and that's when he was like, forget it. You're wasting your time out there. You know, you've made money, but it's been swiped. It's gone. And, you know, they don't even pay you anything. And um, I'll send you money. Give me your bank account details. And I was really, I was, I was too strong. I was like, too proud. And like, no, nope, I don't want your money. Give me your bank details. No, nope, I don't want your money. You know, um, I'm coming over there. I'm going to pack your bags and I'm going to bring you home if you don't listen to me. And I was like, Dad, look, please, just leave it, let it be. I'm getting there. How long is it going to take you to get there? <laughs> that is a you should be thinking about getting married and having children. <laughs> but I want to do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, Dad was the first person I called because um, I shared everything with him. Um, he was, he's my best mate. So he, he was the first person that I called, no matter what, happy, sad. Um, yeah, and he, Instead of congratulating me, it was like, come home. Mm. It's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then it was just a game changer then thereafter, I would say. And All right, perfect. Uh, I know your life is a roller coaster, up and down, yeah. and very quickly. Yeah. The audience listening don't know about that. Yeah. So, I really hope that you will be open to share with us when you felt like you're on top of the world, on cloud nine, and suddenly you. So tell me about it. So um, I promised myself, remember I was coming out here on vacation many years prior to me moving um, and being around uh, a group of friends, a large group of friends, I used to see the problems that were occurring mm. in the group of friends. So I promised myself when I go to Dubai and I move out there, I'm going to put my head down. I'm not going to have any boyfriends. I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to study and I'm going to smash it because that was my best goal. Myself. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Within three months of me landing, I met someone. Okay. <laughs> um, and within a year of me meeting him, we moved in together. So he moved into mine. Um, and it was a fruitful five years, I would say. Uh, ups and downs like any relationship would have. But, uh, you know, I loved him. We were ready to marry one another. Families had met. Uh, we were ready to, to kind of move forward. Um, life was great. I was earning money, I was power of attorney for a lot of people, I was traveling every year, um, three, four times a year to different destinations, um, until one day I get a phone call and it was from a member of staff that worked with my partner at the time um, to say, you know, I have a lot of respect for you, Ramel, I love you loads and I think you're a great person but you're wasting your time with this jackass. And I'm like, well, why would you say that? He's like, well, look at your WhatsApp. So it was like, ding, 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 ding. All of these messages started popping up with screenshots. And it had come to my attention that my partner was cheating on me. No. And that feeling, again, remember I said to you that heart feeling when your heart is beating and you're shaking and when you've done the sale? It was the same feeling. But it's not pleasant. <laughs> but it was it was hotter. Yeah. <laughs> I could feel the heat inside me and I could feel this gulp in my throat. I felt like I had been betrayed. I had um, I felt like I had been trampled all over. I, I I was angry, you know. 
Um, and I think when you're in anger, when you're in these uh, situations, you do things that you didn't, you wouldn't have dreamt to have done when you were, when you're not angry. Um, so I drove down to his company. <laughs> I drove down to the company and I, I, I went crazy because I was upset, really upset. You know, how could you do this to me? Or, you know, what is going on? And has this all been a lie all this time? And you want to marry me? And we, you know, we've met each other's parents and family, and we were going to go ahead. And so you wanted answers? Yeah, I didn't get them. He said I was mad. I was making it all up. The guy in his company didn't like him because he got fired recently, and blah blah blah. The only answer I had was go back to the UK. I needed to be around my family. I, um, I'm a home girl, I'm a family girl. I need to be around loved ones when I'm in situations like this. I went home um, in the month of uh, December, for the whole month, in 2016. And it was such a dark time for me. I was older and I was like, I, I, I don't have time to meet anyone and I wanted to get married and I had my life mapped out. You know, I'll be married in a year, I'll have kids possibly in a year and a half. And all those dreams came crashing down. And it was, and again, I was ashamed because I had introduced this guy to the family and the extended family. You know, now I have to tell them, oh, it didn't work out and, you know, we're not moving forward. And, and, and again, it's that, that shame aspect of everything, you know. I was, um, I cried. It was like I'd, it's like someone had chopped off my left arm. It was like, um, like, he had died and um, and he was unreachable, you know, because every time I wanted more answers, I used to message or I used to phone and he just used to ignore it and he wouldn't reply back. So it was just a really dark time for me. I remember those days where I just slept and slept and slept and I just keep the curtains closed. And my dad used to get up and wake me up in the morning uh, with uh, pancakes or a cupcake because I'm a sweet tooth person or or, or you know jam on toast with tea and to open the curtains and say, look, it's not worth it, get up, let's get going, let's do something for the day, let's go for a pub lunch, let's have a drink in the garden, let's do a barbecue, what would you like to do today? And just try and move, lighten, lighten yeah, up my mood. Course. But I just couldn't see past that darkness, it was just, I was, I was hurt, I was angry, I was sad. Um, one day, I remember this really clearly and, and it was, I am ashamed to talk about it right now, but it kind of made me, realize it's not my time, I'm destined for better, you know. Um, I prepped my clothes, I'd uh, um, got into the bath, I had done all my bits and bobs, you know, shaved my legs and buffed myself out. I got ready, got my dad's whiskey, I got a number of tablets, written my letter, put it aside, and it's like, the relationship that I had with Dad, it's like maybe he sensed it, that something wasn't right. At that moment in time, when I picked the bottle up and I had the handful of tablets in my hand, um, and he burst in the room, literally burst in, and I was like what, with the tablets, ready, literally knew what I was doing, opened my mouth, threw them all out, got me to spit them out, hugged me and just held on to me and he said it's fine and that's when I just I let go and I cried and it felt like I cried and cried so loud it was the, 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 the tears were coming from my stomach um, and he was like look if you want to go home the same thing go back to Dubai pack your bags and come back I'll come with you we'll do it together I couldn't face coming back to Dubai because I kept saying I don't want to go back I don't want to go back I mean I don't know what I'm going to do I don't know how I'm going to do this. I was with this guy from the minute I landed, in effect, for five years. Everything we did, we did it together. Every restaurant we went, we'd gone together. The supermarket even kind of upset me, you know. Um, so, no, it's fine. Uh, and I came back to Dubai. I came back to Dubai and I cried and cried. I couldn't even sleep in my bed for three months. I could, my maid was sleeping in my bed. I was sleeping on the sofa. Because she was looking after my home while I was in the UK for that duration. Um, and when I got back, she was like, okay, I'll go now. I'm like, no, why don't you just stay a night? And then I said, okay, I'll go now. Why don't you just stay one more night? You know, and it turned out that I didn't, I just didn't want her to go. I needed someone there. So she ended up staying for three months 
in <laughs> an end suite bedroom while I was <laughs> sleeping on the couch. Um, so yeah, that was the, the, the shittiest time for me. And then um, I came back to work and it was Provident. I came back to work in January, January the 3rd. Ramsey at the time said to me, I've, I've got, can you come into the office? And I had a letter, a resignation letter ready. And remember, I only been with the company for three months, right? When I joined. Yeah, I think you guys joined in November. Yeah, November, yeah. No, October, November. No, September, October, November. I was there December. I was away for the whole month. And Ramsey said, can you come into the office? I uh, want to sit down with you. And I was like, yeah, sure. Again, freaking out, not knowing what was what. Um, I'd gone in with my letter of resignation and he sat down and he, he had a letter on his desk saying, run out. Oh yeah, what's that? I'm thinking in my head. Um, he was like, you know, how was London? Blah, 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 blah. I was like, yeah, everything was great. And obviously no one at work knew the problems that I was going through at home because I used to take off that jacket and hang it at the door when I used to walk into work. Um, because it shouldn't affect what you do on of a daily course. basis in your business. Um, Ramsey, uh, you know, said, I got a letter for you. And I said, I got a letter for you. And we were both kind of at a tug and war with two letters and I went ladies first and I, I yanked the letter out of his hand, held onto mine. I'd opened it and it was such an inspiring, beautiful, motivational letter that he he had written, taken time out to write to say, you know, you've done so well in the short space of time that you've joined Provident. You're self effective, self efficient, you just get on with it. And I could really see a true star shining in 2017. And Provident are going to support you because we've seen a qu something, a quality in you. I literally fell to the ground and I burst into tears. Uh, it was like that tunnel that you're walking down, which was dark. All of a sudden, someone, it's been dark for so long, and someone opens this light, you're blinded by it. And the, the joy, the, the, the feeling of not only being promoted at that point to take over property management, but to have someone say, you're great at what you do, mm. you know, and you, you know, you can, you can make a difference in, in people's lives. Um, I fell to the ground, I cried and he leant over the table and was like, are you that happy going into property management? I was like, no. You just have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea what I've been going through. Mm -hmm. And then from there, okay. and from there, and then from there, I it was hard again. I remember, I said I'd come out of that relationship. From there, it was it was really hard for me to go back home. I didn't want to go back home. I didn't want the memories of going back to that flat. I hated it. Um, Catherine was there. Anyway, but uh, I used to stay as late as possible in the office. Um, I used to have my little iPad on with Netflix and I just used to work 10, 11 o'clock at night and property management was given to me in a black bag, if you remember, you know, and it was, this needs sorting out, Go, get on with it. And I just wanted it to, to work. Um, and there were full reins I took over the department and just focused my life fully into that. Fast trying forward. to forget what you've been yeah. going through and the hurt yeah. and the pain so it's like I have this anger let me put it at work it, it will be more productive to yeah. me which was actually yeah. which was really productive but it made you anyway workaholic yeah it made you so focused at work that there's nothing else in life which you totally lost uh, I don't know, you shifted to your... Uh, Fully. Yeah. Yeah. So... It was like, me, I'm, I'm worried about me, it's all about me now. I focused so much on others in my life and I felt, like, felt that I was let down by, you know, someone that said he loved me. Um, I'm not going to do that moving forward. I'm going to think mm. about me and I'm going to think about growing me and... Mm, love yourself first. Exactly. And, and in know. fact... That when I was in London in uh, that month of December, I actually had a tattoo tattooed on me saying "Love yourself first." Um, and so it's funny you say that. Um, and I kind of just implemented that in my mind and, and just moved forward with that. Um, and yeah, I became a workaholic. But the thing was, 
I started to really enjoy what I was doing because it was so diverse. I was dealing with landlords, I was dealing with tenants, I was making sure that they were getting a service that was provided, dealing with any issues and maintenance. I was kind of doing it anyway for the investors that I was working for, but this time, you know. This time you had never time for yourself to yeah. think. Yeah. It was always like overwhelmed with work, yeah. so. And I just got on with it. But uh, um, I think if you enjoy what you do, time flies, right? You just, you don't know that you've been and fast forward three years now, um, you know, the, the department has grown, as you mentioned, to just over 250 units and we've, we've you know, had... Do you think the team members now yeah. have more than 10? Uh, yeah. Maybe more, I'm sorry, not yeah, counting about, <laughs> Yeah, it's about 10. So, they, I mean, it just shows that um, you can, whatever you put your mind to, it's possible, you know, and I want to continue, I don't want to stop there, I want to continue growing that empire. But... I had another um, major step in the face. Yeah, major step in the face. So you passed, you got over him, yeah. your ex-partner, you're enjoying life, you're enjoying work, you felt again like... Back and forth to the UK with seeing yeah, dad and the family. Super delighted. And super then, happy. Then I get a phone call. Uh, October the 28th to say your father's been taken into hospital um, and he's in ICU. So I was like, okay, and I usually, I don't think, I pack my bags, I go. Um, this time we had a number of projects that were live at the time and I couldn't just pick up and go. So I'd spoken to the family and they said, okay, he's okay, he's stable, he's in ICU, it's, um, He's got a chest infection and he's, you know, on a, a breathing uh, apparatus in effect to help him. Um, but he'll be okay. He'll be home in a couple of days. I was like, oh, okay, great. You know, if I can try and fly out on the weekend, I'll fly out on the weekend. Uh, closer to time, something wasn't sitting right with me. And uh, I'd spoken to, I'd called the, the hospital directly because my mum was giving me the information. I called the hospital directly and I said to them, um, I'd like to speak to the nurse in charge who's looking after my father. Um, they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. We'll get her for you. Come on the phone. Who are you? And I was like, I'm Arvin's daughter. Oh, I'm sorry, we, we can't disclose any information to you because you're not listed as next to kin. I was like, sorry. Rang my mum, mum, can you go downstairs to the patient section and register my details so she can have this conversation? Mum did it immediately. Um, I'd called back, the lady answered, and uh, I said to her, right, cut the crap, don't massage me, what's going on with my dad? Um, and she said, your father's having a multi-organ shutdown. Oh. You, I, I said to her, she's like, your mum knows, but I don't think she's actually understanding, I think. Or apprehending yeah, it, yeah. Because dad, it was weird, even though he was having that multi-organ shutdown, he, he was, he was talking, he was, you know, he was himself, he was normal, but he was having this multi-organ shutdown. It was weird. So mum was like, no, he's fine. He's talking, he's fine, he's doing his thing, he's, you know, everything's okay. Um, so I said to her, right, I guess I need to make my way over. She was like, yes, I think you do. Every time I book a flight to go to the UK, I always take the 3 a.m. flight because I leave for the airport at 12 midnight and I get to the UK at 6 a.m which gives me enough time to shower, get home, get ready, and do what I need to do. Uh, this time, it kept throwing me out of the flight. Like, I couldn't book it. It showed that there were seats available, but I couldn't book it. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't book it. It was weird. So I thought, okay, next flight, 10 a.m. in the morning. I'll take that. Booked that. The only last seat that was available on that flight, and I remember it was right at the back, near the toilet. I was like, great gone on it and a number of events started happening really weird events started happening on the flight I don't know whether you want me to go into it or not but it went we got into it then I'd landed in the UK as I'd landed in the UK as soon as the flight landed I came out of um, baggage I got the phone call to say can you not come home can you come straight to the hospital I was like uh, no I'm gonna go home and put my bags down I'll come and see dad after that my brother was like no can you please come here straight away? I'll take your bags and I'll put them in my car when you arrive. My heart started beating. 
and I had this um, gulp in my throat. I could just feel like a stone. I couldn't breathe. I was like, <gasps> and I said to him, pass dad the phone. He went quiet. And I went, Limel, give dad the phone. And he's like, I can't. And that's when I knew I didn't Something get there in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's when he said, um, dad's not here. And I literally fell to the floor in the air, in the airport and and just burst into tears like fully burst it's like everything was dark around me I couldn't see all the hustle and bustle that was going on I was in this box and I was alone you know and it was dark um, so dad died that dress is so and um, I know that he was your best friend, he yeah. was like your rock, he was like yeah. whatever you were feeling, yeah. up, down, left and right, he was the person yeah, to absolutely. talk to. So, how long did it take you to start recovering mentally, physically from this? You know, to be honest, um, when he passed away, I never really had time to, to grieve in any way because there was so much that needed to be done. And with me, I wanted the best of the best. I didn't want just anything or anything, or that will do for the funeral, or that would do for the food. I wanted it to be what his favorite foods were when guests were coming to eat, when we had the wake. I wanted it to be the perfect funeral. So he passed away sadly on a Friday, which gave me Saturday and Sunday to sit back and you know have family, family, family coming in and out of the house. Um, it took a long time to finalize a, a funeral directors to, to get everything done. But I still don't think I've got over it and I don't think I'm gonna get over it because, you know, having your dad and working with your being, I mean, how can I say this? Um, your dad is your dad, right? And I have these moments once I've, okay, let's rewind a little bit. Um, the question is, how long did it take you to get over it, right? I'm sure you haven't gotten over it yet, but no. I'm saying just to start recovery because I know you like once you're sad, you shut down totally from everything. So yeah. how long it took you to start, let's say, leaving the house, talking to people, uh, coming back to your work? Uh, even when you came to your work, you were not like all there. Mm. It was like physically you're here, mentally you're all over. Yeah. So how long you how long it took you to get your concentration back and? start feeling like uh, About, uh, everything still will be okay even though I miss him so much and mm. I, I need to adapt myself to live without him. Yeah, it took me, I would say, a, a good solid uh, three months. And like you say, like my vessel was here, I was here, I was sitting there, but I just, I wasn't mentally there. It was like you were talking to a brick wall, you know. Um, there were times where I just had to leave and, and go home and I just wanted to get in my bed and turn the curtains down, you know. Um, and it was one day that I thought to myself, you're going to lose everything that you've, you've, you've made in this time. Get up, get to grips with this. It's happened, it's life. And your dad would be really upset if you let all of this go because he passed away. Use that, use the passing of his um, life as strength to move forward. To keep going and, and make keep him going. Proud. And exactly, and make him proud. Um, and then it was just that one day I woke up, came in, and even Zainab was like, whoa, you're a different person today. Everything okay? How are you feeling? She coaches me, she's really good, love it a bit. Um, so yeah, fine, bish bash, bish bash, bong. I was back to normal. Yeah, I was going home. I was having those quiet moments in my four walls and I cried and I cried and I cried. But again, it, I, I woke up in the morning, I put on my work, my, my work um, jacket. I'm going to work, this is work. And, and I just cracked on. Um, you know, I think there's always gonna be ups and downs in people's life, right? Um, you just really need to focus on focus on your end goal and where you want to be. Um, 
and you know, coming from a community of like an Indian community, um, there's so many expectations one must follow. You know, you should be married by a certain time, you should have kids by a certain time, you know, you should have, buy a house by this time, and so on and so forth. But with with my family being so liberal, you know, and me always being a rebel, um, I always kind of um, rebelled against what society or the Indian society wanted you to, to be uh, or portray you to be. Um, I don't know what it is, it's just like I get a hunch and if I know it's right I'll go for it, if it's not then I won't. Uh, yeah. So you got your heart broken twice, the first yeah. time was okay, the second time it's like that's, that's your best friend and you still came out of it and you came out of it stronger than before and that inspired you and led you to do something in the future. I don't know if you want to reveal it on the podcast even though I will be honored to have you feature it on this medium and say what are you planning to do. I, I want to encourage young females um, to, how can I put it? Put it the way it is. Uh, I want to encourage females to not feel like um, religion or how we should be in an Indian community or a Pakistani community or whatever community that they're in, not to, no, it doesn't sound right. I don't know how to put it. I think you, what you're talking about, that since the minute that we've born, they give us labels like names, religion, beliefs, cultures, yeah. and that is you have to follow it. Uh, women are only good just to cook and raise kids. Yeah. You cannot have dreams. You cannot do yeah. something about yourself. Every job that you want to say, I want to do that, he will tell you no. That's like a male Match. job. And yeah, yeah, it's not for you. Stay away from me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you're trying to say that you want to encourage the women just to follow what they feel they're passionate about That's without right. being scared from uh, what's the society gonna say or what is this gonna do or I'm gonna shame someone or not and I'm telling you uh, today you're my eighth guest which is my favorite number by the way uh, all of the previous guests who came on the show they all told me like my mom wanted to be a doctor my mom wanted to be an engineer my mom and no one even did it and they were all the rebels in the family and they all made it so yeah this is something super noble i really encourage you even if i can do something uh, with you i would love to do that and now we want to tell the audience how to reach you uh, you can reach me through mobile or email, so zero facts. On the social media, also, oh. please mention. <laughs> <laughs> also on social media, so do you want me to list? Uh, say your accounts, yeah. Um, I can't remember if I can change it. Instagram. Yeah. It's YOLO something. Uh, YOLO Rolo. I YOLO think. Rolo. Oh, okay. Patel, just, yeah. Um, so yeah, you could reach me um, on all social media sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Um, as well as Provident Property Management, uh, .ae. <laughs> We're going to be you. dropping all of this information in the section. Uh, thank you all for listening to this. You have heard it. That's a woman who started her career by the age of 30. Whenever she felt like she made it, something really hard hit her, but she still came back and came back stronger than before. Thank you all for watching and see you soon in a new episode.